Hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Joseph and this is Shea Bastida. I have known her for six years and counting now. We actually started a nonprofit called Re Earth Initiative that focuses on environmental justice and education. And I thought it would be the perfect person to kind of interview uh, learning about indigenous rights as well as a connection to immigration um, to the US. So do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, project, Joseph. Um, and yeah, my name is Shia Bastida. I'm 19 years old. I was born and raised in Mexico as part of the Otomi Toltec indigenous community. And I moved to the United States when I was 13 years old um, because of my parents' job. And they have been focusing on indigenous rights and climate justice since before I was born. They actually met in the first Earth Summit in 1992 uh, to talk about indigenous rights and to talk about climate justice. So that was 29 years ago. And now, uh, you know, this new generation is really focusing on climate justice and my parents' journey has informed me a lot on what we need to advocate for, what are the things that we need to watch out for. And that's why I'm really excited to continue their legacy and excited to be here to talk about what I've learned. Perfect. Um, as you just said, you're part of the Atomi Told Nation. Um, so can you tell me more about the core values of indigenous philosophy and the connection to that, what you take into your own work? Yeah, so I would say there's three things uh, from my upbringing that really informed everything that I do uh, in terms of activism, in terms of climate justice, and just in terms of my life in general. The first one is the value of reciprocity, which means that we just have to be aware of the fact that Mother Earth gives us so much and we the only thing that asks is that we give back. And we have been in a system that is very kind of like extractivist, taking everything. Um, and that is putting the art systems in stress. So I think that that first value, not only reciprocity in small communities, reciprocity in your family, reciprocity for yourself, but in a bigger scale, that's a really very huge value. Uh, the second value is kind of intergenerational cooperation. In indigenous culture, there is a seven generation principle, which says that we need to uh, really listen to the wisdom of the past seven generations to ensure the stability of the future seven generations. And in current society, we don't talk about time in this way of the seven generation principle. We talk about the next quarterly report. We talk about you know, the next uh, election cycle. And it's such a short term uh, kind of way of living that we, the decisions that we make, they're not really uh, ensuring that we bring wisdom into them or that we and like are paving a stable path for future generations. And the last um, value that I think is really important, uh, well, it's kind of in line with this is just uh, living in community. I think that we have become a very individualistic society. Uh, a lot of the things that we do is for who has the highest grades, who can get into college. and. We're part of that, you know. We we had to go through the whole process. We had to distinguish ourselves from other people. But why do we have to go through so much stresses when we could, you know, turn into a more uh, community-based way of thinking that is not so individualistic, not so competitive, but more collaborative? And this goes not only for, you know, our, our lives in general, but just for the world. You know, the United States still wants to be the best. They still wants to be the top. Even when solving the climate crisis, they say they have to lead the way. And that way of thinking is not gonna get us, uh, you know, like out of it as a, as, a, as a world, as nations together. So um, those are three principles that I think are very important. Perfect, and of course I see that your line of work, especially in Re-Earth and the kind of the core values that you share with your parents and that you learn through Mexican culture kind of go into the Re-Earth into a global type of movement. So of course, how does that affect the lens that you see both like sustainability as well as the climate crisis through, like how does that kind of influence it? So I would say that because I grew up in Mexico and then I moved to the United States at a very young age, um, I and I still don't qualify as an immigrant because to be an immigrant, you have to completely leave your country. So right now I am on a visa and a student visa and I've been in the United States for almost seven years, but um, I still think that many of the immigrant experience I've had it and it was very shocking to me to move to the United States into a new country see you know especially in Mexico we idealize the United States a lot we really look up to the way of living to 
you know, the, the way that it works, the, all the stuff people have, you know? And I think that most of the world sees the United States like that, as this perfect world where you can achieve the American dream. And when you get here and the reality is completely different, when you see that the legacy of racism, racism is still here, you know, the legacy of um, kind of not respecting women's rights, the legacy of, you know, a lot of different things, you realize that everywhere you are, you have to fight that you have to really speak up, that you have you can't be complacent to what we think is, you know, the things that we have to look up to. So coming from Mexico, it really showed me specifically that, uh, especially moving to New York, New York City, that the United States does serve as this place uh, for your voice to be amplified. So I saw New York City as a global stage. And I knew that if I did something in New York, it'd be heard and it would have more impact than if I did something in Mexico. So I really took that opportunity to start, you know, lobbying uh, for climate justice legislation, to start organizing strikes that in the September uh, 20th strike in 2019, we got 300,000 people to march on the streets. And that was, you know, news worldwide. Um, so I think that that is one of the ways in which I was able to take uh, kind of my knowledge of how the world is the US to my advantage, to our advantage, in order to really use it as best as we could um, to, you know, especially in a country where you do have the liberty to protest, you do have that right to have your rights protected when you're out demanding change. And that is not the case in Mexico and in a lot of Latin American countries. It's actually very dangerous to be an activist in a lot of Latin American countries, uh, like Colombia, like Chile, like um, Guatemala, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil. And all of these countries, you know, with COP26 that just happened, a lot of these uh, communities have to travel to a different country to protest their governments. And in the United States, we do have that ability to protest here. So I think that we should really um, be conscious of that when we try to protect uh, people's rights. It's not that people don't care in other countries, it's that sometimes the avenues to demand change are not as accessible. Yeah, so we've talked about the difference of coming from Mexico to the United States, but then there's also struggles within the United States about class and wealth and gender and of course, we started re Earth together, but I've never really experienced being a woman activist. So how has that changed through immigration to the United States versus you talked about how you could not be an activist in Mexico. So is there something that people should know about the struggles of being a woman activist specifically? Yeah, I think that, you know, in Mexico and, in, and a lot of Latin American countries, I have Chilean as well. Um, there are huge uh, issues with women's rights and just um, in terms of, you know, attacks on women for being women, things like that. And these are things that don't really happen in the United States. So I think that first off, it's a lot safer to be an activist, a woman activist in the United States, uh, which is why, again, we have to be a lot more um, kind of cognizant of that ability that we do have to protest here and not in other countries. Um, for example, uh, you know, in Mexico, there was this huge movement and also in Chile, uh, just kind of calling out the government for uh, not protecting women, for not speaking up when women uh, are disappeared by different, you know, kind of dark things going on. And that doesn't happen here. And we have to be um, just like use that to our advantage and call out all of these things that all of these systems that allow this to happen. Uh, but just in the environmental movement as a whole, I've seen that a lot more women are part of the climate movement. A lot more women and girls from around the world are the ones leading a lot of the um, a lot of the movements in their communities. And we see it at Re Earth, you know, like 90% of our members are women. And that is not to say that, you know, we don't want, you know, men to be part of it. <laughs> it's just saying you know, a lot of the extractive system that takes advantage of the resources that Mother Earth gives us is the same patriarchal system that is kind of, you know, allowing women's rights to be disrespected. And men are the ones who have the responsibility to step up and say that is not right. And that's why people like Joseph, men like Joseph, who are so sweet. <laughs> um, you know, it's really about 
kind of stepping up and saying we cannot allow these systems to continue happening and we need to step up and protect um, Mother Earth's rights, protect women's rights, protect um, kind of just the basic things like women's rights to education in a lot of countries, you know? Um, Drawdown, which is this book that talks about the hundred solutions to the climate crisis that already exist. Solution number, like one of the top solutions is uh, education for, for women and girls around the world. Because for so long, we have left a lot of the feminine qualities out of decision-making. We have left kind of emotions, motherhood, like all of these qualities out of international relations. And those emotions, those like, you know, getting in touch with a lot of the repercussions that these decisions have is what is gonna allow us to make more holistic decisions. And we have just completely left out of the conversation for the sake of, I don't even know, like just detachment, kind of like, you know, um, manlyhood, like all of these things that are, have, right. have, yeah, have led us to the world where, in which we're in, where, you know, it's, there's a lot of, like you said, a lot of wealth inequality, a lot of, you know, still a lot of countries where uh, being an activist is not permissible, where women, uh, being an, a women activist is even less permissible, so. So a little, I'm gonna go into a little bit of a secret here about you. Um, so I know that you have a Chilean and Mexican passport as of mm -hmm. right now, so you're a dual citizenship. Why have you not decided to do a full immigration status and let, leave both of the Chilean and Mexican passport and become an American? Because you could get a US citizen, you go to school in the US, but instead you stick with the visas. And it's always mm -hmm. like the question of like, do you feel a like a strong connection just because of indigenous rights and indigenous people? And of course you're part of a nation um, within an indigenous group within Mexico. So is it more of like the core values that you share is more Mexican and Chilean than American? Because it is hard to assimilate, especially when you immigrate yeah. to the US um, at a, such a young age when you can be influenced by so many different factors. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's this idea that uh, you know, I've heard it so many times that the U.S. is this melting pot. Yep. And I think that's so wrong to say because that's kind of saying that you have to leave your identity behind when you move to the U.S. Saying you have to leave your culture behind. Saying you have to leave what makes you you behind. And I think that part of the reason why I don't want to give up my um, nationality to Mexico and Chile is because I want to hold on to that identity. I want to hold on to my language, I want to hold on to my traditions, I want to hold on to everything that my grandmas have taught me. Um, and I think that the United States, especially, it is a country built on immigration. And the demonization of immigration is so odd to me because, you know, every single person that is here, except for Native Americans, have either been brought to this country or have been, you know, chosen to immigrate in this country. So um, I think that instead of saying that there's some US values that we have to adopt when we move here, it's more about encouraging people to preserve their culture, to ensure diversity, recognizing that the United States is the second country with the highest speaking Spanish speaking population right after Mexico, more than any other country, but also in Latin America. So, you know, there's just so much diversity of culture, so much diversity of perspectives. And that is what makes, uh, you know, a lot of the United States uh, kind of exciting for me. You know, the fact that you get to meet so many people from so many backgrounds and to wash that all away to say that you have to have an American identity uh, is so odd because what is an American identity without your culture, you know, exactly. without your past? Yeah. Uh, so I think that, you know, that's really main, like part of the reason why I don't want to leave any of makes of, sense that's why I kept on my Colombian identity even yeah. though it seems like it's such a distant like reality of right. being connected you kind of just hold on because you feel like it's a part of you no exactly it is um and it's weird when you talk about the U.S. villainizing a lot of American countries especially Mexico when you think about mm -hmm. the border and so much talk of like the border and immigration in the U.S. and how they don't align with U.S. values the fact is is that even the people that are talking about those things and have those beliefs of Mexico and Latin Americans and people immigrating, they were here to immigrate for a purpose. And they also 
create such a diversity within America that we're used to, especially growing up in New York City. So when you, especially in our line of work mm -hmm. and when we get re we get a lot of pushback based on a few biases. So can you talk about those biases, especially relating to indigenous rights, which a lot of people know you for, but I've gotten some pushback about me being Colombian. Is there pushback for you being indigenous? Is there a pushback from you being Chilean? Like what are some of the challenges that you face through just your own identities? Yeah, it's hard because um, there, and I didn't even know this when I moved here, there were so many stereotypes against Mexican people and indigenous people uh in general you know and it's it was you know i realized i was kind of in a bubble in mexico not knowing the perception that the world had of mexico so when i moved here and it was like this one stereotype of this one mexican guy with a hat in the desert i was like i, I live somewhere where it's 50 degrees all year round yeah. like it's like well, there's no desert like, you know what i mean that's only in the north which i guess it's um closer to the us so that's why that's the perception but it's so weird to see that there's so many built stereotypes and all of these microaggressions that I went through saying like, oh, you are not what I expected from somebody from Mexico, or do you speak Mexican? Or are there universities in Mexico? Like all of these questions, I, I was like, what is like, why is the United States so shielded from just admiring and being able to recognize the richness of culture around the world? And the other thing is that I've been here so long that when I speak up for Mexico Mexico, and I say I represent a lot of youth in Mexico, a lot of people in Mexico actually say, you don't get to represent us because you don't live here full time. So I think it's also balancing that, knowing that when you live in two places, you basically have a dual identity and you don't really belong. There's always people who are gonna think that you don't really belong at any other place. But it's up to you and it's up to us to take that space and say, I do belong in Mexico. I am Mexican. I do belong in New York City. You know, I've been here for seven years and I get to go and, um, you know, lobby for legislation. I get to go and demand things uh, wherever I'm, I'm at, because I think the most important thing we can learn when we move to different places is to be part of community, be part of change, be part of advocating for something better. And with something like the climate crisis, it's so global that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can advocate for it and it's the morally right thing to do. So, yeah. Yeah, I totally, it's hard because you get attacked from both sides mm -hmm. because if you don't fit in one specific box and there's always the issue of like, where do you exactly fit into? Because you grew up yeah. in New York City, you kind of connect to New York City, of course, you went to high school with me and now you're going to college mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. So all of those dimensions kind of bring into a very diversified person that I see growing and evolving every single day. So how do you exactly fit one box? And there isn't exactly. one. And I find it interesting that when we went through the college process, you had to ch check off the box right. like Hispanic or Latinx. And there wasn't any other breakdown of that. It wasn't I'm Colombian, I'm Mexican. Right. So it's like they just put us into one box and they expect us to kind of stay there and kind of follow those values. So of course, I want to ask because you're so an advocate of like amplifying your own voice. So how do you attack the root of that problem in, in the US and where do you start? Is it through education? Is it through activism? Like how are people actually able to attack prejudice against them? Because that kind of goes across mm -hmm. all aspects, especially against yeah. immigration, so. Yeah, so, you know, one time I saw, I like tweeted something and somebody commented, this girl is so weird. You know, she says she's Mexican. She says she's Chilean. She says uh, she's Otomi. She says she, you know, lived in New York for so long. Like she doesn't even know where she's from. And my mom was born in Spain because of the Chilean dictatorship. So I also like I'm technically half Spanish, but not, you know, blood, yeah, just exactly. like my mom <laughs> was born there, but she like moved to Chile after. So my identity is just so mixed up that it like, you know, it feels like I don't really fit any single box. And then I could like check like half the boxes there, you yeah. know what I mean? But then again, it's, I think it like, that's part of the beauty of living in such an interconnected world that you get to have multiple identities and you get to explore all of these different parts of your identity. And when there is kind of attacks that come at you because of those identities, it's just people who haven't figured out their own. And it's people who haven't, had the opportunity to know where they're coming, where they where they come from, what their traditions are, what their culture is, and so they want to attack you for not assimilating 
to whatever they want you to assimilate to. So I think that part of the strength is knowing where you come from. Part of the strength is always going back to that. We have this you know, idea that everything that, that we do has to be forward looking and there's gonna be this new technology or this new thing that we're gonna to have to go and strive to. But in reality, I think we have to look back to our origins. We have to go back to um, kind of the original, my dad calls it the original way of thinking, the original way of living, uh, which basically means living in community, uh, celebrating uh, your culture, uh, practicing your traditions, but obviously in a more kind of open, loving way in which we also teach other people about them and learn from other people as well. Yeah, so that is basically all the time that we have. Um, I think that you're one of the prime examples of a person that has persevered in terms of activism. Am I seeing you grow as this leading figure of a woman activist? And you don't have to check any box, but it's just like beautiful to see that you take the values that I saw that you first came with in the United States. Now you're amplifying it globally because I think that we could all kind of share that type of connection to we can't fit in one box. There's no specific possibility. And, and also we all have struggles. So how do we actually find an equilibrium and like an equal uh, landscape to actually all connect and kind of strive to work towards the same thing. So I want to thank you again. Um, you're the best. So um, we're going to continue. So we are the co-founders of Re-Earth Initiative. It is a educational platform activist. Um, it's global and it's intersectional as well. So we don't focus on one box. We focus on multiple boxes mm -hmm. and we kind of tick everything and we want to really amplify the voices of the people who are voiceless in some sense um, and we bring that into account whenever we talk and interview or do anything we always want to make sure that everyone has a voice and everyone has the space to do it so i want to thank you again thank you bye guys <laughs>